of Spelman College were marked by innovation and growth and her visionary leadership was recognized in 2013 with the Carnegie Academic Leadership Award. She's the author of several books, including the best-selling Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race and Can We Talk About Race and Other Conversations in an Era of School Resegregation. Dr. Tatum is a sought after speaker on the topics of racial identity development, race and education, strategies for creating inclusive campus environments and higher education leadership. In 2005, Dr. Tatum was awarded the prestigious Brock International Prize in Education for, for her innovative leadership in the field. A fellow of the American Psychological Association, she was the 2014 recipient of the APA Award for Outstanding Lifetime Contributions to Psychology. As a civic leader in the Atlantic community, Dr. Kadem is engaged in educational initiatives designed to expand educational opportunities for underserved students and their families. In Atlanta, she serves on the governing boards of the Westside Future Fund, Achieve Atlanta Morehouse College, the Toll Charitable Foundation, and the Georgia Power Company. She is also on the boards of Smith College, TIAA Charitable, and the Educational Testing Service. She holds a BA degree in psychology from Wesleyan University and a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan, as well as an MA in religious studies from, Harvard, from the Harvard Seminary. Over the course of her career, she has served as a faculty member at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Westfield State University, and Mount Holyoke College. Prior to her 2002 appointment as president of Spelman College, she served as dean and acting president at Mount Holyoke College. In the spring of 2017, she was the Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor at Stanford University. She is married to Dr. Travis Tatum, and they are, they are parents of two adult sons. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Beverly Tatum and the CEO of Multicultural Bridge, Gwendolyn Van Sant. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be here with all of you. I'm sorry, actually, that we can't be together in person. I lived in, the, in Western Massachusetts for 20 years, and I was looking forward to being back in the region. Uh, and so here I am in Atlanta, and there you all are, and here we are on Zoom. But I'm delighted we're still being able to have this conversation. Thank you very much for the invitation and the warm welcome. Gwendolyn, you're on mute. Somebody muted me. Hi, <laughs> thank you. So we're gonna get started with the conversation. There was one more new Pathways Lab norm that I didn't share, which is that when you're talking in the chat, we're asking that it just amplify the conversation that's going on or wait for a pause in discussion so that we're not distracted by a secondary conversation in the chat. We really wanna have all of our focus on um, Dr. Tatum for today and it's worked well for us in other pathway labs to hold that norm. So I thank you all for doing that. So we're going to um, jump right into the conversation at this point. I think most of our attendees are here. Um, so Dr. Tatum, you've been speaking quite a bit about race, race identity and education over the decades, and especially focused on these topics during this time of COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter uprising. Please share your perspective on what needs to be top of mind for educators and parents as our children enter schools or re-enter their schools, whether it be remote, hybrid, or fully present in the school building. Sure. Well, thank you for that question. And certainly as the school year is starting, one of the things that I'm hearing about uh, from educators and students is a real desire to talk about what's been going on in our country. You know, people have referred to this as the summer of racial reckoning. I'm not sure um, it is, but certainly there's been a lot of uh, discussion and daily we see news related to race and racism, social justice, um, particularly as it relates to the criminal justice system and with police shootings and other events taking place. So it's a hot topic, no doubt. And I think many young people will be coming into classrooms, even young children uh, with questions. And so I think for uh, educators, 
becoming more comfortable with facilitating conversations that um, are race related is an important skill to have. Getting comfortable with those conversations is important. I know that many teachers struggle with those conversations, particularly white teachers are uncomfortable, um, perhaps because they didn't grow up having those conversations. And I always like to um, start these conversations like the one you and I are having now by just acknowledging the discomfort that many people have. Yeah. I think it's important to just reflect for a moment about where that discomfort comes from. And I like to ask participants to think about their own growing up experiences. Pat Callahan joined the meeting. If we were all together, we, and I could see everyone, I would ask uh, each person, I'm gonna ask it anyway, but I'm gonna ask each person participating today to just take a moment and think about their own earliest race related memory. You might have grown up in a community that was very homogeneous. Maybe there wasn't much racial diversity, but in my experience, most people can think of something um, that goes back to their childhood, some race related experience that they remember. And if I were to ask for a show of hands, maybe you know people would raise their hands and they'd say, yes, I've remembered something. And then I would ask, how old were you at the time of the thing you remembered? And I would say that most people, when I ask that question, will usually reference school age, you know, maybe six or seven, sometimes as young as four or five. But typically, most people have a memory that goes back to their school days, usually elementary school days. And then I would ask, well, what feeling is associated with the thing you're remembering? And for most people, that feeling is an uncomfortable one. You know, people will say things like confusion or fear or anxious or embarrassed or angry or sad or ashamed. There are all kinds of words that somebody might use, but what you hear in the ones I've just put forward is feelings of discomfort. Now, sometimes people say, well, you know, I was with a friend who was different from me racially and my feeling was of love or friendship. And, and certainly that's a wonderful thing to remember if that is true for you. But for most people, that early memory that they call up is one of uh, associated with some discomfort. And then I like to ask the question, well, at that time, did you have a conversation maybe with a concerned adult, a parent or a teacher? And most people will say they didn't. They did not have a conversation. They didn't tell anyone about it. But if you think about those first graders, you know, those six-year-olds, those seven-year-olds, those second graders, one of the things we know about them typically is that they're pretty chatty. They don't filter much. They are blabbing about all kinds of stuff, right? Blurting things out sometimes to the uh, chagrin of their parents. And um, so it's kind of interesting to see that there's so many people with an early memory at an age when they don't filter much, and yet this particular thing did not get discussed, did not get talked about. And if you ask another question, which is, why do you think that is? Why do you think, you, you know, why didn't you tell anyone? People will say in one way or another that they figured out that they weren't supposed to talk about it, that it made the adults uncomfortable, or sometimes that the, the adult was the source of the discomfort. Maybe it was the parent or the teacher who did or said something that they're remembering. But whether that was the case or not, somehow they figured out that this is a topic I'm not supposed to talk about. And if we got that lesson at five or six or seven, it might have been the first time, but it wasn't the last time. Um, certainly throughout our lives growing up, and certainly in the US society at least, we know that it makes people uncomfortable to be um, to be having these conversations. And so for the adults in the room, the educators, getting past one's own discomfort is part of the journey. Um, but being able to have those conversations in the classroom, particularly when the nightly news is full of uh, current events that could be part of our teaching practice, I think is going to be important this fall. Thank you for that. Yes, that's what it's been top of mind for us is how how children are entering. We haven't seen kids in school since April, so 
I think that's a really great advice for all of us to really address the whole child first and what they've been experiencing before they jump back into their academics. Um, I had the fortunate opportunity in 2017 to go to a church in Northampton where you relaunched um, your 20th anniversary edition. And if I could say people were sitting on the walls, that would be accurate. I mean, it was quite an amazing event and I was really inspired. And I had been inspired by your updated prologue and, um, and really the charge in the epilogue to really partner with social justice organizations. And given my role, that, that felt like a charge directly towards me and Bridge. So I'm wondering, what, what have you seen that's had positive impact from those partnerships? That's my first part of my question. I'll ask the second part after. Sure. Well, you know, every community has its own issues. By that, I mean, you know, its own particular history, its own particular concerns. I live in the city of Atlanta and, uh, you know, I, I've lived here now 18 years. I'm not from here. I'm from Massachusetts, but um, but here in Atlanta, there's a legacy of segregation, right? A legacy of residential as well as school segregation. And so one of the issues, one of the things that I have seen um, working in Atlanta is something called the Atlanta Friendship Initiative. I wrote about that in the epilogue of my book. This was the brainchild of two men um, who were involved in, a, in the local Rotary Club. And one uh, was white, the other's African-American. And the white man approached um, the black man and basically said, you know, we know each other as acquaintances, but we, you know, we haven't really spent time together. But I'm concerned about the continuing separation in our community. I'm concerned about the persistent impact of racism in our community. And I think that, you know, it's important for people to, who are different from each other to get to know each other. And so would you be willing to spend time with me so we could get to know each other in a deeper way? And um, the black man said, yes, I'm willing to do that. And the two of them partnered and actually became quite close friends. And they launched this thing called the Atlanta Friendship Initiative where they identified leaders in the community and matched them kind of like, you know, a friendship match <laughs> experience, <laughs> <It's> Ma <laughs> match them across lines of difference with the instruction simply that you meet together at least once a quarter, maybe for lunch or something, and then, and you know, get to know each other, but intentionally matching people who are different racially, um, different ethnically, perhaps different in some, maybe religiously different in some specific uh, social category. And to date, hundreds of people are now participating in this effort. There's no political agenda associated with these friendships, but they are the, the folks come together. And it's clear that as those friendships are um, maturing, people are having new insights about the problems in the city that they might work on together. So the hope is that um, with greater empathy and awareness, action comes from that. And I think we can see some of that happening certainly in projects, some of which are, I'm involved in, uh, you heard the boards I'm involved in in Atlanta, um, you know, those are multiracial efforts to expand opportunity and access to high quality education, uh, improve economic opportunity and housing, other things. That's just one example. But I think that um, connecting and breaking down stereotypes is part of the process. It's not the only thing, right? We know that people can uh, have, someone might say, I have love in my heart for everyone and still behave in discriminatory ways, right? Still accept the status quo without questioning, you know, who's represented in the classroom, without questioning um, what's the, what are the disciplinary practices in our school and are they having uh, an adverse effect on kids of color? I mean, there, there are lots of policy and practice questions that reinforce racism in our society that in, require us to, take, to, to think critically and take action, whether we are feeling love toward other people or not, right? That, that, um, and that sometimes we can feel love and not take action. So I think it's important for us to be clear that there are actions that we need to be thinking about, policies and practices we need to be focused on to create more equitable learning environments. Thank you for that. And um, 
that's where at 11 o'clock when folks join us again, come back, that's what we're going to be focused on is what actions we can come together in a community and refine or build together. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, I've been doing a lot of reading just in our role as partners with different schools and different educational institutions. So we've been looking at the pandemic and the impact on families and and one of the terms that's stuck in my brain is white flight, the new white flight in education, because Bridge also does a lot of work with um, banks and talk, we talk about the mortgage system and white flight all the time. So it was a, the, the concept resonated with me when they were talking about with this fear of the pandemic that folks that can afford are sort of clamping down and protecting their own children in different ways um, that are adversely impacting school districts. So I'm just wondering what your feedback is on that, what you've seen and what you have to say about that. Um, well, vis-a-vis -vis the pandemic, I, I'm not sure that I can really make much comment. I mean, certainly we know that um, the more resources you have, the easier, easy, easy is perhaps the wrong adjective, but the, um, the more possible it is to um, maintain a relative level of comfort. You know, if you have resources, you don't have to go to the grocery store. You can have stuff delivered, right? If you... Um, if you have resources, you don't have to worry about, is my internet working? You know, I mean, Zoom can go out, right? We, we heard about that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, some people have the technology and the access that they need to be able to do the work that they need to do. Their kids can access um, the educational resources that might help them. Um, but if you are, a single mom with limited income and you have to be in the grocery store while your kids are trying to learn at home, um, you know, that's a challenging, without your supervision, maybe they've got access to internet, maybe they don't. I mean, there are obviously differential, differential impact. And, you know, certainly uh, you talked about white flight. Certainly we understand that um, access to resources is not totally determined by race but highly correlated, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's certainly poor white kids who are struggling, um, yeah. but the different, the wealth gap between communities of color and white communities is certainly very clear. And the more resources you have, the better, the easy, um, the more capable you are of weathering any challenge, whatever it might be. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're actually already ready to transition into the breakout rooms. I have one more sort of- Well, we have to give instructions. <laughs> yeah, I have one more open question that you could lead us into your ABC. So just sort of how would you- Sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, it's amazing how quickly the time flies. And I know that the, um, the uh, participants are gonna be in breakout groups. And one of the things that we wanted all of you to be thinking about as you return to classrooms are um, something I refer to as the ABCs. A stands for affirming identity, B stands for building community, C stands for cultivating leadership. And to just say a little bit more about that, the A, um, affirming identity, really speaks to the fact that in order to be successful in school, every child needs to feel like they belong there, right? And, and that you have been uh, welcomed and accepted by your, your teacher, by your peers, that sense of belonging is critical. The, um, but affirming identity speaks to how we make that sense of belonging possible. So if we were to imagine, I like to use this analogy to make this point quickly. If we were to imagine that um, there was a group photo of everyone on this call and we were all gathered together, somebody took a group picture, the first thing we would do when we got our copy of the photo would be to look for ourselves in it, right? You know, each of us would be looking for ourselves in that, where was I? How, are my eyes open? Am I smiling? How do I look in this picture? And some of us, hopefully all of us would find ourselves in that picture. But let's imagine that, you know, every 10th person, 10% 10 of us were somehow left out. We were digitally removed from the picture. Mm. We would look at that photo and we would wonder, what's wrong with the picture? Why, you know, why am I not included in this photo? And we might think there was something wrong with the picture, but if it happened over and over and over again, we would then say not what's wrong with the picture, but what's wrong with me? 
why am I not ever included? So there are kids who are gonna enter our classrooms who are gonna be looking for themselves in the classroom. Am I represented in the curriculum? Do I see myself on the walls of the classroom? You know, are there pictures up that I might find myself in? Um, how am I being recognized and appreciated? And that's the A. And so one of the questions that um, I hope people will be thinking about is who is reflected in the classroom environment and who's missing from the picture? That's all about affirming identity. B is about building community, about creating that sense of belonging. And you can't really do the B, the building community, unless you've been paying attention to the A, affirming identity. But we all do things in our schools to try to create that sense of being um, a part of a larger community, whether that's you know school spirit, the things we do to create school spirit, but we should also be thinking about how are we building community across lines of difference? Are there kids who are racially different than the other kids in the classroom who need to feel included in that building of community or linguistically different or different because of other, uh, you know, religious difference maybe, or maybe difference because of family of, you know, place of origin. There are all kinds of ways that difference can show up. And we need to be thinking about how are we creating a community that is including all of those. And then finally, the C, cultivating leadership, is how are students honing leadership skills in a diverse context? And what does that mean? It means that even though somebody's growing up maybe in a hill town that is largely white, um, if they grow up and go out into the work world, they're likely to be working in an environment that is, in, that is not just white people. They're likely to be working in an environment that reflects the larger population of the United States. I was born in 1954, a long time ago. Um, in 1954, the US population was 90% white, 10% everybody else. 10%, not just black, but 10% black, Latino, Asian, Native American, all together, just 10%. Today, if you're born today, you are being born into a world uh, in the US that is 50% white, maybe even a little less than that. Um, increasingly, young people are gonna be growing up in a population that, is, that doesn't have one single majority, that, um, that it's gonna be a pluralistic society. And if you don't know how to engage with people different from yourself, you're really not gonna be prepared to be very effective in that society. So we have to think about how are we helping young people develop the leadership skills that they're gonna need in an increasingly diverse world. So there are these questions to think about, affirming identity, building community, cultivating leadership. Um, and so I hope that, that will lead to a lively conversation in these breakout groups. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so Sarah, thank you for putting them in the chat. I was also going to attach a screenshot, but thank you for doing this. That's good. So everyone, if you can see the questions in the chat, that's what you could take um, back into your groups. Um, we have breakout groups and most people who've been with Bridge have, have done these, or if you've been doing Zoom all summer, um, we have more breakout groups than we had planned because there's more people than we had planned. So even the small groups are big groups. There are 30 each and there's nine of them. So what we're gonna ask you to do is spend the time for 25 minutes on those questions and then choose one person that you believe can report back in one minute. <laughs> sort of the high points and then like maybe the, yeah, the high points for each of these questions, okay? So there'll be a person that's gonna be really charged with representing the discussion in your group. I'm going to ask that you um, share time equitably and um, just have a great conversation. Thank you, Dr. Tatum for teeing us up. Um, please remember that when I close your breakout room, you don't please sit on your hands. I know many of us were good students and followed instructions, but you don't don't come back. Zoom will dump you back in that those last minute, that last minute and a half will give you time to wrap up, have someone finish their sentence and come back easily to the group. So even though it says leave room when I closed it, you have a grace period. So I'm just going to. Whoever, somebody's gonna get a prize when there's a group that no one comes back early, that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> um, but enjoy your conversation and we look forward to seeing you in a few minutes.
Gwendolyn. Roberta, join the meeting. Hi, everybody. Everybody's muted in my group. Hi. Sorry, I was having trouble. I had to watch it on Facebook. So I just finally got my tech guy to get me on here. So did you already discuss the questions? Um, not, um, no, I'm just here as the tech person. I'm trying to get people uh, to head back into their... Uh, their uh, breakout rooms. Um, can you can you make me join a breakout room? 
I can try. I'm gonna can you, try if you can, out. could you put me in with Tommy Vitrowski? Because that's who I've been sitting with, kind of watching that before they got me on. Okay, I can try. I have to find the exact setting, but I can try. And how do I sign in so they know I was part of this group? Um, I'm not exactly sure. Okay. Uh, give me just a second. Okay. Why is that doing Just so if you get yeah. into mine, you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just feel bad because I'm not being a part of this. Yeah. But you're all set here. You know, says lots of hoops I have to perform for you. So obviously, she's done this for more than me. Right? And be careful of the charger. Mm hmm. Hey, Lynn. Yeah. This is Brian. How do I start the video? Just start video? Just press start video? Yes. Okay. Yep. I'm all new at this, so. Yep, that's okay. They had, I, my tech guy had to come up and get me set up because I'm already on. But for some reason, I had to watch it through Facebook, so. Yeah, I try. <laughs> I had a hard time uh, making a, a account because uh, it said I already had an account, but it, it must have been a home home account. Same, same here. It wouldn't let me come on for the same reason. Yeah, I couldn't get on. I couldn't get on the uh, the district one, and um, mm -hmm. I didn't know my I didn't know the password for my home one. So yeah, I don't, I don't have it. It's my. It must be my daughter. Probably <laughs> up for school. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so we're waiting for more people, huh? Brian, are you are you experiencing this like delay and having my voice come like after I've already talked to you? No. 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 Mine's doing some weird thing. Hmm. But How well, the, no, we need we need to be put into a breakout room. We're not being put into one yet. Oh, okay. Let's see. I'm going to see something. Oh, Brian. Yeah. Brian, if you click at the, bring your mouse down at the, and get the bottom to show things. Yep. Click breakout room. We need to join one. Okay. Do you see where it says breakout rooms? Yep. Click on that and join a room. Join a room. Gwendolyn, you're muted. Okay. Um, so who's on the 5600 number? Hello? Can you unmute one more time? I won't click. Hi. 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 This is Roberta. Roberta? Hi. Yes. Hey. Hey. I tried. I tried getting on online. I I don't know. I it was asking for like a password. I just kind of got frustrated, and so I just called in. Okay. So I'm gonna try to put you in a breakout room. All right. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, sorry, Mom, about pulling you out of the thing. I, I, 
I don't see Roberta's phone number. Usually they're at the bottom of the list. Oh. Ashanti, are you with me or yeah? Yeah, I'm in this group where I see JV and then uh, two other people. I yeah, see I don't three know. and then the 5600 number. Yeah, I don't know why it won't let me move Roberta into a room. That's but I think we're also still live on Facebook. Oh, hi, everyone. <laughs> I see. I think people are just coming in now, so it just keeps dropping them into the main one. Yeah, and I keep moving them, but Roberta, it's not letting me do Roberta. Because it says zero and a sign. Hi, everybody on Facebook that's watching us. <laughs> Hey, Roberta. Hi, Glenn. Hey, if you, do you have a, can you sign in through Google to um, this link? Cause then I can move you. It's not letting me move the link. Um, okay. Do you have, a, you have a link? Should I check my email? JB, can you send Roberta at our city email? Hmm. I don't know why it's not letting me move her. It's like hmm. giving no option. It's like you're in stealth mode. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> They're in breakouts for another 11 minutes, but I don't know. Oh. I think it's just the three of us, but how do we end or pause Facebook Live? You have to, you have to stop it and start it again. Oh.